Hello everyone and welcome as you join us again for another of our Bible study sessions. Uh, we have been looking at pneumatology over these last uh, couple of sessions and again uh, it's another part of that tonight. Uh, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit uh, in the Bible, uh, in, God's, in God's Word. We've come up really uh, so far at the moment to the book of Ezra. That's how far we are uh, in session three now at this stage. Uh, so we're looking at the book of Ezra and Nehemiah because the two of them are historically around the same time in history and uh, they're very connected obviously biblically as well and what is going on there at that period of time in Israel's history. And then we're looking at the Psalms, uh, some of the Psalms tonight and how the Holy Spirit is envisaged and written about in those three books and uh, this particular section of pneumatology. Before we go any further, I want you to think of a moment of uh, orange juice. Uh, I don't know whether you like the stuff or not. Uh, orange juice, particularly if you find it in a bottle, something that's maybe diluted, you'll find there's this kind of uh, cloudy stuff at the bottom of the bottle or a pulpy type stuff. In fact, you can find it in fresh orange juice at times too, if it has time to settle and you have that uh, stuff that needs stirred up really. So you really put your hand at, at one end of the bottle or cup, wherever it is, and try to stir up the pulp or the uh, that cloudy stuff that is at the bottom of orange juice. And in fact, other drinks as well do the same. And this uh, stirring up is really something uh, that we see here uh, that the Holy Spirit or the Lord is doing within people. He's, he's starting to open the eyes and make people aware of his presence so stirring up and we see it in our first verse tonight which is Ezra uh, chapter 1 and verse 1 the very first verse of the book if you have a bible or access to scripture just feel free to open that and it says these words in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom, and also in a written edict he declared. It's quite a chunky verse, uh, but it gives us uh, an idea uh, of the period and the timeline uh, when Ezra uh, existed. Ezra and Nehemiah really should be amongst the last books uh, in line in the Old Testament, but they're in a particular position uh, about halfway through because they come historically and chronologically in time toward the end of the Old Testament period. It's the uh, sense of the, the second temple being rebuilt and the walls of Jerusalem. And the two separate projects are also uh, being raised again. Ezra is the priest at the time that the Lord is anointed to, uh, to help the people coming out of exile. Remember, they're returning from Babylon uh, back into Israel at this time. Ezra is the priest. Nehemiah, he's the chap who's been designated the leader to rebuild the walls uh, of Jerusalem. And Zerubbabel, uh, he's maybe somebody uh, you don't hear of just as much, but Zerubbabel actually had the, uh, the task of rebuilding the temple. So they're all very busy people at this period in Israel's history. And the, Babylon, uh, sorry, the Babylonians have just been defeated by the Persians. They're the New World Order at the time. And Cyrus is king uh, at this particular period as Ezra's book opens. Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. Jeremiah, that's the same prophet in the large book in the Old Testament. He's around at this time or has spoken uh, into the exile, but also post-exile as well. And so that all can be accomplished by God's word through Jeremiah. The Lord stirs up the spirit of King Cyrus. Now, this is quite interesting. Here we have uh, something of God going to address the people. And uh, an edict comes out. That was something a king normally put together, a type of law that he made. It's an old-fashioned word really for that. Uh, that he's going, God is going to address the people uh, and amazingly, God uses Cyrus to address the people. 
Now, Cyrus is a heathen. He's a foreigner. He's someone who knows nothing of the true Lord. And yet, God uses him. Now, you and I, if we are Christian people and we belong to a church and we belong to the worldwide church of the Lord, might find this quite challenging. Some of us might have that mindset where God only works in and through the church or in and through Christianity. God can work beyond the church walls and beyond Christians. In this case, he's working through Cyrus, a heathen of Persia. Because God's uh, mission is bigger than the church in the world. It's what we know as the Missio Dei. It's a Latin word for the mission of God. And sometimes we look at good things, in inverted commas, going on in the world. You think maybe of some of the disasters that have happened lately uh, in places like Morocco and Libya, where you had the flood and you had the earthquake. Uh, you have stuff going on, of course, in Israel and Gaza at the moment as well. And there are people needing help and sometimes called humanitarian aid. And it's not necessarily Christian. It's just people doing, in inverted commas, good things for others. Who's not to say that God is working even in those realms? He can work beyond our finite mind and our understanding. And here in this particular place, we see that God is working through Cyrus. He's stirring up his spirit. Now, it's not the Holy Spirit, notice. It's stirring up the person of Cyrus. Remember, spirit in the Old Testament, when it's adjoined to someone, is who they are, their personality, their character, uh, their demeanour, all of that, and including their soul, who they are as a unique person. And God's stirring up the spirit of Cyrus. And uh, it's amazing then uh, what unfolds from there. And of course, Cyrus is someone who has um, a soft spot really for Israel. He, uh, the Persians were not as hard on the Israelites as were the Babylonians before them. And uh, the, the um, Persians were also into prophecy. So when Cyrus would have heard of prophecy, he would have took note. He would have sat up and listened. They were into it themselves. But Jeremiah, he may have even read Jeremiah's words. He may have read Daniel's words. Daniel was around in this period of history too. And maybe that's prompted Cyrus being an open heart, a softened heart before the Lord. And the Lord uses him uh, in all of this situation. As a challenging question, does the Holy Spirit work through an unbeliever? And we've been looking at that as regards uh, the world and how God might work. So it's quite a challenging question. You know, when we first come to faith, and those of us who have done that, uh, we are all unbelievers, of course, before the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And it's the Holy Spirit that convicts and then converts. It's the Holy Spirit's work that does that. We are unbelievers before we meet with the Lord. So those first of us coming to faith, uh, we are unbelievers until the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Now, we don't know if Cyrus comes to faith in any way, shape, or form the true Lord after this, but God works directly upon him. Doesn't mean he comes to conversion in the Lord, but he is used by him at the same time. Now, as we, uh, we move on in the book of Ezra, we're going to look at uh, verse 5 of chapter 1. And it says, The heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred, got ready to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. I notice it's God himself, God the Father that stirs here, doesn't say anything about God's Holy Spirit or God's Spirit of the Lord. Nothing like that. It's simply direct God the Father in verse 1 and in verse 5 again. He's stirring up the priests and the Levites, those of Judah and Benjamin. Now these are God's people this time, the Israelites. And uh, he has um, got a certain number of them 
ready to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So under Zerubbabel, the, the man who rebuilds the temple at this time after it had been destroyed by Babylon, there are other people here who are going to go up with him, but they've been stirred by God to do so. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit has indwelt in them or anything like that that we've seen in previous um, scripture in the Old Testament, but simply a stirring. It's almost like a rising up, uh, an eye-opening, a uh, desire uh, to do the work of the Lord. Not all uh, exiles return, as not all people from Israel departed when the Babylonians first came into Israel. There was always a remnant left. And there's also a remnant left back in Babylon too. So not all exiles return. But moving on from Ezra, those are really the only two verses where we see a stirring up or a sense of, the, uh, of God working. Uh, amongst these particular individuals within the book itself. But we'll just look at Nehemiah because uh, we have to look at Nehemiah alongside Ezra. They are, as I was saying earlier, a similar period in history together and doing similar work. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 20 and 30. Verse 20 says, You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouths and gave them water for their thirst. And verse 30, it says, Many years you were patient with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not listen. Therefore you handed them over to the peoples of the lands. Now this particular uh, section of um, Nehemiah's book is actually Ezra addressing the people. He's the priest, remember? And in here, uh, everything is ready to go. There's the sense of the wall being rebuilt and the temple being rebuilt. And now Ezra is dedicating that. And he's doing it publicly in front of everyone who is present. And he's going back over history and uh, how God was with the nation of Israel uh, for many, many years and you see a little reflection there in verse 20 of the wilderness period, the uh, Israelites leaving Egypt under Moses. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. Ezra is addressing God here, your good spirit. He's referring to the Holy Spirit here. And did not withhold your manner from their mouths and gave them water for their thirst. In here, uh, we see an awareness of the Holy Spirit. And a link to supply by the Holy Spirit, obviously. And then prophecy again uh, in verse 30. And many years you were patient with them, warned them by your Spirit. There's the Holy Spirit again through the prophets. Yet they would not listen. So in there we see the sense of uh, God's Spirit working in prophecy, but also in provision uh, in those days. Really, that's all I want to draw out of Nehemiah. Uh, to, so with Ezra and Nehemiah, just interesting to see what's going on there with God's hand and the Holy Spirit working. We're going to move to Job now, uh, and then eventually the Psalms. So Job, first of all, Job is a book of wisdom, really. It falls into the wisdom literature. It's an interesting book. Probably, well, many believe that's the oldest book in the Old Testament. And yet again, it's in the middle stock, so it doesn't come along chronologically. But the reason why people believe it's one of the oldest books, if not the oldest book, is that uh, it's a book about suffering and the addressing of the question of suffering in the world. Why we have suffering? Why, if we have a good God, does he allow suffering? And uh, does, he, does he actually perpetuate suffering himself? All those questions in there. And it's the oldest question in theology. Suffering. Why does it happen? when we look at uh, theology in the sense of God with humanity. It's the oldest question, the sense of suffering. And that's why they believe the story of Job is very much something that's been there from the beginning of time uh, in humanity. So Job 4, verses 15 to 17. Uh, if we read those verses together. A spirit glided past my face, the hair of my flesh bristled. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice. Can mortals be righteous before God? 
Can human beings be pure before their maker? Now, this is an interesting uh, set of verses here. Eliphaz, he's one of what we call Job's comforters in the story of Job. You have three men who are friends of Job's, but they're not a great help to him if you read uh, how they see Job and his suffering. They keep blaming Job that he's done something, even though they can't perceive what it is. That he's done something, maybe even secretly, before God. And now God's punishing him uh, by letting him suffer. And so they're not great help, and hence the phrase, sarcastically, Job's comforters. So Eliphaz is one of those men. Zophar and Bildad are the other two. But this is Eliphaz's uh, response uh, to how he sees Job and his suffering. He talks about a spirit in verse 15 of chapter 4. Glides past my face, the hair of my flesh bristled. It's almost ghostly uh, when you read that. A spirit glided past my face. So what is a spirit? What's going on there? It stands still, but he could discern its appearance. A form was there, then there was silence. Then he heard a voice. And the question is asked, can mortals be righteous before God? Can human beings be pure before their maker? Well, this spirit has to be from the Lord. But it's a spirit. It's not the spirit of God. Therefore, in many ways, when people look at this, the spirit is probably an angel or a messenger from heaven. It's a spirit. And because it's, it's bringing um, a message from God uh, in those questions in verse 17, it has to be a heavenly being. Eliphaz can't discern its appearance, but it stands still. Something uh, interesting is happening there in his vision. Uh, he sees a spirit gliding past his face. And then we move to Job 15, verses 12 and 13. Why does your heart carry you away, and why do your eyes flash, so that you turn your spirit against God and let such words go out of your mouth? Now in here is back to the human spirit again. This is Eliphaz again responding to Job. Uh, why does your heart carry you away, and why do your eyes flash, so that you turn your spirit against God and let such words uh, go out of your mouth? So in here we see um, the sense of fullness of turning away from God. Your heart, it's the very centrality of who we are, it is our heart and spiritually speaking too. Why does your heart carry you away? and Why do your eyes flash? In other words, what Aliphaz is saying there is it's almost like rolling your eyes. That's what he's calling it there, flashing, is rolling your eyes as if, hi, sure, I believe you. That's a bit like what Job is probably thinking uh, about Eliphaz and his response to the question of suffering in his life. And why do you turn your spirit against God? This is the fullness of turning from God. The spirit remembers the holistic part of a human being. Remember, heart, soul, mind, strength. And that's personality, characteristics, everything. You turn your spirit against God and let such words go out of your mouth. So he's getting scolded here. And uh, Eliphaz thinks that Job uh, is turning fully away from God. We know that's not the case when we read the full story of Job. And then we have another one of Job's comforters uh, in Job 20 and verse 3. This is Zophar this time in his response to Job's questions. I hear censure that insults me and a spirit beyond my understanding answers me. Now, it's an interesting verse too. And a spirit beyond my understanding answers me. So far, he's maybe thinking that all the wisdom in the world now is coming to him uh, or from the Lord uh, beyond my understanding uh, answers me. So this sense of uh, so far believes that he may be gaining wisdom from the Lord. The a spirit again is most likely uh, to be a messenger of God, some or an angelic being from heaven, because it's not the Spirit of God. But it's beyond uh, Zophar's understanding too. And uh, again, an interesting verse on how God is working uh, with that particular man at that time. 
And we move on again to Job 26 and verse 13. Now, this is uh, Job's words this time. By his wind the heavens were made fair, his hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Now, by his wind. There again is ruah. You remember the Hebrew word, the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. By his wind. It's the ruah word in here. And uh, you, ha you have this sense uh, of a picture uh, of really going back to creation that Job is saying here. By his wind the heavens were made fair. Reflecting back to the very start of Genesis 1. You remember the Spirit hovered over the waters. God's Spirit hovered. The ruah of God. The wind of God. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Almost that sense of uh, Satan uh, being thrown out of the Garden of Eden too in that verse. So by his wind, the Ruah of God, Job is referring to here. And then Job 27 and verse 3 says, As long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Again, this is Job. He's maintaining his integrity here at this time. I don't know why God has done this to me. I haven't done anything particularly wrong. He doesn't ever uh, curse God uh, in the book, but he has lots of questions and lots of falling out. <coughs> Excuse me. As long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So in the sense of we have a double-sided thing here, the breath, in other words, the human spirit of Job while he's alive and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. The Holy Spirit is also within me. So my spirit connecting with the Holy Spirit and vice versa. And that's what Job is saying there. As long as that's there, I will not lie. My tongue will not utter deceit in the next verse there. The breath is the life source of a human being. Job wants the Holy Spirit of God to be his life source uh, throughout all. And then it's Job 32, <coughs> excuse me, and verse 8. Now this is Elihu. Elihu is the fourth man that talks to Job in the book. But Elihu is a little different from the other three. He's a younger man, but he has amazing wisdom for his years. Wisdom that is well beyond the other three. And Eli, who is actually a good help uh, to Job towards the, the, the end of the book. And we see the spirit of wisdom coming out in verse 8 of chapter 32. But truly it is the spirit and immortal, the breath of the Almighty that makes for understanding. It is the spirit in immortal, the breath of the Almighty that makes for understanding. This is the spirit of wisdom. As only the Holy Spirit can give God's wisdom. There's wisdom in the world by people uh, living a lot of life experience and maybe a little bit more mature in years and you gain a little earthly wisdom. It's not the same as the spirit of wisdom from God. It's a different kind of wisdom. The breath of the Almighty. Here's the Ruah again of God that makes for understanding. It's the Holy Spirit that brings uh, wisdom. And the Holy Spirit, in the sense of wisdom, wisdom is feminine in the Bible. I don't know if you've ever known that before. The spirit of wisdom is feminine. Now, Hebrew, uh, the original language, uh, the Bible, the Old Testament particularly, was written in. Hebrew is one of these languages that has male and female roots to many of its words. A bit like French in uh, more modern times. Uh, you may think of words that are le something, uh, that's male in French, or la something is female in French. And Hebrew is the same. And the spirit of wisdom is a female root. And it's interesting, it's for another day's debate. Are there feminine qualities to God our Father? Quite challenging when we think about that. But in here, truly it is the spirit in a mortal, the breath of the Almighty that makes for understanding. So the spirit of wisdom um, is the only um, sense of the Holy Spirit working in us. It gives us the true understanding of what God is saying and trying to do in us. 
Moving to Job 33 and verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty that gives me life. In here we see further wisdom from such a young man as Eli, who is the Spirit of God has made me. Here he is saying to God, it's your Holy Spirit made me who I am. The work of your Spirit within me gives me wisdom and all that I am before the Lord. And the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So here you have the Ruah and the Spirit of God all together uh, using just different terminologies for the Holy Spirit there and gives him life. We have no life until we are uh, in God our Father, but particularly uh, the help of the Holy Spirit to help us live for him. And then we look at Job 34. This is the last Job verse we have, and it's verses 14 and 15 of Job 34. It says these words, If he should take back his spirit to himself and gather to himself his breath, all flesh would perish together and all mortals return to dust. Now, this is quite prophetic in some ways, these verses here. Again, it's Elihu, this great spirit of wisdom from God. If he should take back his spirit to himself and gather to himself his breath, all flesh would perish together and all mortals return to dust. Now, he's speaking of God here. So in other words, if God was to return the Holy Spirit to himself, there's no life in the world, and I'm speaking spiritually and eternally. The Holy Spirit being taken out of the world, evil will persist and reign. All flesh would perish, and all mortals return to dust. All mortals do return to dust. But if the Holy Spirit wasn't there, there would be eternal lostness. The Holy Spirit comes, as I say, to convict, to convert, to comfort, to lead, to guide. And he's only some of the things he does. So God should take back his spirit to himself. This is a sort of thing that will go on in the eternal sense. And Eli, who is very wise in that, and it's a couple of verses that speaks of the whole of humanity there. The Holy Spirit is not present in the earth. There's an eternal lostness that lies ahead for all of humanity. So it's quite challenging verses. Eli, who's speaking way back in the realms of history in a prophetic and eternal way. Moving to the Psalms now. And uh, Psalms, again, a very unique book. Biggest book, of course, in the Bible. All 150 Psalms contained therein. Uh, lots of wisdom in the Psalms too. Not known as particularly a book of wisdom. It's a book of poetry more than anything else. But there are aspects of wisdom writings within it. And so we look at Psalm 31, first of all, and verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. You maybe have heard, it's quite a, a well-known verse, that. And uh, you remember Jesus said it from the cross when he was about to die. Others have said these words over the years too. Famous Christians have used these words as they passed away. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. <clears throat> There's that sense of the psalmist as uh, giving his spirit, all of himself, over to the Lord. And you have redeemed me. He's giving thanks to the Lord for his salvation. So it's not the sense that he's dying here, but the sense that he's committing his whole life, his whole being uh, to the Lord in thankfulness for the salvation uh, that uh, God gives within that. Psalm 51, a very famous psalm within the book. It's the psalm where David, you may remember uh, the story of him and Bathsheba. Um, and um, he had wrongly sent Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, to the front line of the battle to get him killed, to cover up uh, the pregnancy that Bathsheba was having, who David was actually the father. He committed adultery with her, and she did become his queen uh, later on. But you remember the um, consequence of the story was the baby Bathsheba was carrying did die. And, uh, but Bathsheba did become Solomon's mother. Uh, later on, of course, David's successor to the throne. 
But this Psalm 51 is really David's heart pouring out uh, in recognition and conviction of what he's done. And uh, Nathan the prophet tells a little story about the little lamb. If you don't know it, have a read of that as well. Uh, just uh, after the David and Bathsheba uh, adultery. And uh, he brings David to his senses and he's aware of God and his eyes are open to what he's done uh, through uh, the parable. Actually, it's what it is. And Nathan tells to him the prophet who he was at that time. But Psalm 51, we look at these words, verses 10 to 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Now there's lots of spiritual uh, talk there in those verses. Again, they're very famous verses from this psalm. David's crying out, he wants a new and clean heart and he wants a new and right spirit within him. Now that's interesting because he wants to be made clean in his, in his whole being. First of all, his heart, mind, soul and strength. But also he's, he wants the Holy Spirit to indwell within him. Put a new and right spirit within me. There's almost a double whammy there. Do not cast me from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He wants the Holy Spirit to remain within himself. This is one of the very, very few verses in the whole of the Old Testament that you see the words Holy Spirit being used. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now it goes on to restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. The spirit there at the very end is himself again, his actual um, uh, whole being, uh, that he wants to be willing for the Lord again. But do note the words, restore to me the joy of your salvation. This is quite challenging because David has not necessarily lost his salvation. He still trusts in the Lord, even though he's a bad boy with Bathsheba. He has not lost his salvation. It's the joy he's lost. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Not restore to me your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. But we must remember this doesn't give license for people to do what they want after salvation. If we continue to persist in sin, it's not this once saved, always saved business. That is not a theology that I find in the Bible. You can lose your salvation. We need to have lives that continue to live for the Lord, lives that are regularly repentant, lives that confess before God and are restored by his Spirit. But we must remember that our salvation is something that is secure in the Lord, provided we trust in him throughout all. And when we let him down, to come back to him, not to live or to dwell in the sin, but to move away from it. Confess, repent, and be restored. That's a regular pattern within the Christian life. Not a once-off thing. When we come to the Lord, first of all, yes, of course, that's what happens, and we receive our salvation. But we must continue to walk in the Lord, confessing, repenting, and being restored. David is doing that here. He wants the joy back of his salvation. Joy in the Lord again. That's what's missing. That's what happened in his sin with Bathsheba. But his salvation is still intact because he's repentant here. He's confessing. And the Lord does restore him. And that's the truth of how God works in many people uh, in biblical history as well. Sustain in me a willing spirit in all of that. And so if we see these, these wonderful verses here, the importance of a repentant heart uh, in conjunction with salvation. It's important that it's a, it's a regular lifestyle uh, within ourselves uh, that we are uh, walking with the Lord. Keep your Holy Spirit within me. The Holy Spirit can leave us if we come to salvation and then continue to dwell in sin. The two are not compatible at all. And so we look at verse 17 then of the same psalm. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. That's the sort of 
repentance we should have, folks, when we let God down. We have to have our spirits broken, literally the whole being broken before God. That's what's acceptable to the Lord because he knows them were fully given to him. Because a broken and contrite heart of God you will not despise. Then Psalm 104, if we move on there to verse, sorry, verse 30 of Psalm 104. And it says, when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So this is an interesting um, sense of the use of breath again. Uh, ruah, you may find that in some versions of the Bibles you're reading out there. Uh, you may see things like uh, breath uh, or something like that instead of the word spirit. But it's all the same root. It's ruah. Uh, the wind of God. When you send forth your spirit, here's the Holy Spirit again, they are created and you renew uh, the face of the ground. There's something of recreation going on here uh, again, obviously within those who fell away from the Lord, but also physically uh, within the world too. It's a psalm of creation and provision. It's Psalm 104 from God. And this is further endorsing of the understanding of the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father. You send forth your Spirit. Not just sending your Spirit, but sending it forth, sending Him forth. Something is flowing out of the very essence of God the Father. And there are Christians in the world, and unfortunately we don't always see eye to eye in that particular aspect. Of, there is the belief that the Holy Spirit is a separate identity uh, sent by the Father from heaven. But for those of us who are Trinitarian in that aspect, that uh, we believe the Nicene Creed, we believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, both parts of the Godhead, not just God the Father, but God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, part of the very essence of God the Father and God the Son. So when you send forth your spirit, they are created. You renew the face of the ground. And then Psalm 139, again, an order very famous psalm uh, within in the Bible. And it's this wonderful psalm of God, knowing us before we're even formed in our mother's womb. It's amazing words of how this psalm has seen uh, God and how he's seen himself as well. And it's verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? Again, referring to the Holy Spirit, and the answer to those questions are nowhere. We cannot flee from the work of the Holy Spirit or who he is, and we cannot fly from his presence. And there are aspects of that, of course, in Revelation, uh, whenever Jesus returns. There's nowhere, uh, and no people <clears throat> can hide or not be able to see the rapture. It'll be visible to the whole world. And there's nowhere to hide. And finally, Psalm 143. To finish on as regards uh, this portion of Scripture we looked at today about the Spirit in the Old Testament. Verse 7, it says, Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I shall be like those who go down to the pit. So there's a sense again within that Psalm, Psalm 143, of a real need, holy for the Lord, holy as in W-H-O-L-L-Y, that we need to be completely given over to him, uh, a desire for him in every way. And then finally, verse 10 of that same psalm, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on a level path. So again, the psalmist is saying they're giving all over to the Lord. Let your Holy Spirit, your good spirit lead me on a level path. That's really all uh, I have to say up to this point. Uh, do join us again for the next session on pneumatology uh, where we're looking at Proverbs, uh, wisdom writing of course again within the Old Testament and uh, a portion of Ecclesiastes and a little bit of Isaiah in our next session. But we'll pray together uh, as we finish today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again uh, for your presence with us, for your word. Uh, for the work of the Holy Spirit within the Old Testament 
and uh, what he was doing and how he, you still teach us, Lord, through Scripture, uh, what the Holy Spirit can do still today. So we ask for your blessing, Lord, upon us. And until we meet again, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you safe. Amen.